So we've seen how the ring of fire produces volcanoes that are taller in stature, have more blocky lava forms, tend to be more explosive in nature, shorter duration as far as the actual eruption or when the, the volcano erupts it's a shorter duration in general. Whereas in Iceland things, the volcanoes are smaller in stature, the eruptions occur over a longer period of time which is really more conducive to harvesting the geothermal energy for what we're trying to do is, you know, for heating and electrical uh, electricity production. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the seismic. The seismic Ninety percent of the world's quakes occur in this narrow band around the Pacific, often with disastrous results. Sumatra, September 2009. A giant earthquake left more than a thousand people dead. Mexico, September 1985. More than 9,000 people were killed by a massive magnitude 8 quake that shook Mexico City. And Alaska, March 1964. North America's greatest ever recorded earthquake near Anchorage. This quake was so powerful, ground movements were observed 4,000 miles away in Florida. Such awesome power drives scientists on to discover why these deadly quakes occur all around the Ring of Fire. The investigation moves to Prince William Sound, 36 miles from the epicenter of the 1964 Alaskan disaster. The uh, northern edge of the Ring of Fire, and we're going to be looking at uh, evidence for how geologically active this area is today. Hoisler heads for Montague Island, a place that's permanently scarred by the powerful forces which shape this entire region. On land, he finds a rugged, boulder strewn shoreline. So you can see we're at the edge of the ocean. We're in a high energy environment. There's boulders all over the place. And we're at the top of the beach. Waves have been crashing here and basically getting rid of the little tiny rocks, leaving only boulders behind. And then right here, you can see that these boulders are kind of lined up against each other like dominoes. And so it takes big waves to uh, sort of uh, flip these over and line them up kind of like dominoes like that right here. But it's not this rocky beach that reveals how violent Ring of Fire quakes can be. The real evidence lies one quarter of a mile inland. Hoisler hunts through the thick undergrowth. Hidden by the trees is a near identical line of boulders. Uh, we've hiked in, uh, thrashed through the, the alders, uh, the Alaskan jungle up to here. Uh, we're probably 25 or 30 feet above sea level at this point. And what we have here is a beach. I mean, this is basically a perfectly preserved, high energy beach environment like we were looking at down on the shoreline. And you can see here, once again, there's these big boulders that are uh, sort of laid over in this domino-like fashion. Uh, sort of pointing uphill as a result of this big waves pounding on the beach, flipping the boulders over, pointing in the uphill direction. This inland raised shoreline runs for hundreds of yards, parallel with the ocean. It's a key piece of evidence, and it can only mean one thing. The land itself must have recently risen up out of the ocean, taking the entire shoreline with it. It means that there was an event that was essentially an instant in which this region was uplifted to this elevation and uh, made this here. This, all, this has to have been uh, a result of a big earthquake. Really cool. What we're looking at here is a result of the 1964 Great Alaska Earthquake. Pretty much right here where we're at is where there was the largest uplift that occurred. The massive earthquake here not only lifted the land out of the sea, it also caused a wave of destruction, devastating nearby Anchorage. 
It was a magnitude 9.2. It was the second largest earthquake ever recorded on Earth. It was just enormous. It lasted four and a half minutes of ground shaking. What happened throughout this region offers evidence of the type of quake that makes the Ring of Fire so dangerous. So we know from this kind of earthquake that occurred here in 1964 that this was a thrust-type earthquake, or even there was a fancy term, megathrust earthquake, because it was so big that occurred right here. And this is a result of the slippage of one piece of rock over another, or one underneath the other. Megathrust quakes like this are the most powerful on Earth and are one of the great dangers of the Ring of Fire. If they occur under the ocean, they can generate killer waves called tsunamis. The Great Alaskan Earthquake of 1964 caused a tsunami over 200 feet high. Waves traveled over 1,700 miles, claiming lives as far away as California. But this disaster was nothing compared to what happened in 2004. On December 26th, tragedy struck when an enormous underwater megathrust earthquake off the Asian coast generated monster waves. The coastlines of 14 countries were swamped, killing more than 200,000 people. The vast scale of this disaster was a brutal indication of the power of megathrust earthquakes. And it's given urgency to finding out why these quakes happen all around the Ring of Fire. Once again, the Alaskan landscape is the perfect geological laboratory. So we're headed to a seismic station in south central Alaska near the tip of the Kenai Peninsula. Millions of years of the Ring of Fire's volcanic activity and rippling earthquakes have given Alaska an incredibly rugged landscape. It's not easy to find a flat spot to land. It's clear on my side. High on the hillside lies West's seismic station protected under the yellow cover from the elements and the local bears. So this is the vault where one of our seismic stations lives. This is one of the many seismic stations that dot the state of Alaska. Several thousand seismic stations like this exist all the way from Alaska down to California. And this whole system together monitors any kind of seismic activity, any sort of earthquakes throughout this whole area. It's part of a whole network on all of the volcanoes around here, on the mainland and throughout this whole area. So the seismic data can be used not only to judge the severity of the earthquake, or the, the magnitude, but also when taken across a number of stations to pinpoint the location of that earthquake. In Alaska, we're looking at about 1,500 earthquakes every month. And you take all of those together and you start to see patterns. They, they map out a ribbon of earthquake activity that follows all along the coast. This ribbon of earthquake activity extends all around the Ring of Fire. But it is what scientists can see below the surface that is most revealing. If you look at it from the side, you see that actually the earthquakes that are happening close to the ocean tend to be shallow, but as you go inland, they're deeper. And they create this dipping feature that uh, starts out uh, in the ocean and then dips down beneath the continent. This giant dipping feature provides conclusive evidence for how the megathrust earthquakes are generated. The earthquake epicenters exactly follow the path taken by the seafloor as it moves down underneath the volcanoes. Earthquakes are triggered as the rocks slide past each other down into the earth. So also there's a transformal aspect that he's not discussing here that 
we'll look at in the San Andreas Fault later on, but the big thing here is subduction. It is this subduction of the seafloor beneath the land which creates the Ring of Fire's lethal megathrust quakes and builds its explosive stratovolcanoes. So all of these observations, the volcanoes, the line of seismic activity, the big earthquakes at the interface, all of those are part of one system. They all tie together and are interrelated. The investigation into why the Ring of Fire is prone to such lethal earthquakes reveals a raised shoreline, evidence that the Ring of Fire suffers the most violent megathrust earthquakes. And seismic data shows that these killer quakes are caused by subduction, the movement of the seabed, which also builds the Ring of Fire's giant volcanoes. To discover exactly where this awesome process of subduction occurs, Oceanographers search for the deepest and most inaccessible places on the entire planet. The journey to understand why the Pacific Ring of Fire is so volatile has revealed the critical role of subduction, which pushes the seabed deep down into the earth. In Alaska's Prince William Sound, investigators search for where the seafloor is vanishing below the land. There are um, ridges, outcrops, canyons, gullies, um, mountains underwater. And so the ability to make a continuous map of the seafloor and get a full picture of it gives you the ability to understand how the seafloor is put together and what it has to do with the way the Earth functions. Reynolds is using high-tech echo sounding technology to monitor the exact depth of the seafloor. So a little preview for what we're going to do uh, in geothermal later on is as far as fracking and reservoir production and then drilling techniques we're going to be using uh, uh, reflection and uh, seismic information like you'll see here. A sound wave is sent from beneath the ship. The time it takes to reach the seafloor and return gives an accurate reading of depth. Reynolds' research shows that all around the Alaskan coast, the seabed is relatively shallow. So this is another aspect of geothermal, uh, another job you can get in the industry is uh, seismic exploration or uh, seismic feedback for, from the drilling rig to see which, how, the, how the drilling head's doing and the, the size of the reservoir that you're trying to frack out. You know, where do you place the, the fracking plugs? And uh, we'll talk more about that. None of that's going to be on the quiz this week. But seismology is the big one here. But farther out towards the open ocean, the readings change dramatically. So in general, around the world, when you go out from land, you cross over a relatively flat shelf, down the slope, and into the deep ocean basin, which is very flat. But around the Ring of Fire, as you go out from land, across the shelf, down the slope, instead of going directly into a flat ocean basin, you go across a very deep trench. These trenches are the deepest areas on the planet. And the one around Alaska reaches approximately 21,000 feet. These giant features are called subduction trenches. The largest are deep enough to swallow all of Mount Everest. They mark the exact spot where the seafloor disappears down into the earth. The process that jolts the land in megathrust earthquakes and forms the volcanoes that make the Ring of Fire so dangerous. The Ring of Fire is named for these volcanoes that circle the Pacific Ocean. But offshore of the volcanoes, wherever you have a chain of volcanoes, you also have one of these deep ocean trenches. The location and shape of the Ring of Fire is determined not by its famous volcanoes, but by the position of these deep subduction trenches miles out in the ocean. And by mapping the location of all the trenches in the Pacific Ocean, scientists have made a further, even more significant discovery. 
High-tech imaging has made it possible for scientists to visualize the Earth drained of its oceans. This reveals that these deep trenches outline the edge of a giant rock slab, or plate, that makes up the entire floor of the Pacific Ocean. This huge Pacific plate is one of 14 plates which cover the entire surface of the planet. Subduction occurs where this plate rubs against one of its neighbors, producing the line of volcanoes which extends all around the Pacific. But the investigation isn't finished. Experts journey to Tiger Mountain in Washington State to figure out how such huge plates can be shifted against each other. The GPS that you use to drive around can tell you where you're at on a city block or on a street to within a meter or so. But in geology, we're interested in centimeter to millimeter accuracy so that we can track the changing of the land. It's much more subtle. The global positioning satellite to GPS there is uh, also a big part of what we do for our definition of geothermal resources. And you saw that in uh, topic five last week when we looked at the, uh, the geysers in uh, northern or central California. High on the mountainside, Flake has set up a GPS marker point. Here we are on Tiger Mountain. This is our GPS unit. What we have is these metal rods going into solid bedrock, cemented in so that there's no motion. This GPS antenna allows us to measure point positions per day of where this spot is. A network of these GPS antennas across North America provides evidence for the monumental forces which power the Ring of Fire. This is just a single antenna. There's hundreds all across the Western United States to give us a better picture of what's going on with the ground surface. By combining all the data of these GPS, we're able to see that North America is actually moving. The so you're seeing here that the, the westerly movement of the, the North American plate, and that's how the, the plume is stationary under Yellowstone. And that's how that, uh, the history of the Snake River Rift uh, they theorized that that movement of the plate over the top of the stationary plume is why it tends to be uh, moving to the east. The uh, Yellowstone, the next eruption that we talked about last week, very well could be starting to show up in uh, the Bighorns in Wyoming currently. The entire continent is moving westwards at about three inches per year. This movement is possible because the Earth's crust rides upon a hot, soft layer of rock called the mantle. Well, the mantle is so hot and it's such a high pressure and the temperature is hotter as you get towards the center of the Earth. That's going to want to move out and convect, just like a boiling pot of water. And so it creates a convection current coming up to the surface, which then drags along those plates on top can't overemphasize that convective cycle that he just discussed again. We talked about that in uh, topic two. The convective cycles or the engine uh, as far as the Earth's concerned and then the fuel being the core of the Earth. These phenomenal convection currents force the Pacific plate into its neighbors, driving the process of subduction. As the plates get dragged by the mantle convection currents, they impede upon other plates. One has to give, so one dives down underneath another, and then the trapped water from its ocean sediment escapes and melts the upper lying mantle, and that creates hot magma that rises to the surface and creates the volcanoes that form around the Ring of Fire. The investigation into the forces that drive the Ring of Fire has now found subduction trenches that reveal the shape of the entire Pacific Plate and GPS data providing evidence for the convection currents which force this giant plate against its neighbors. It is this movement of the entire Pacific Plate and the resulting subduction of the seafloor down the trenches that shapes and builds the Ring of Fire. But one final mystery remains. 
Vast sections of the seafloor are constantly being destroyed. But despite millions of years of subduction down these trenches, the planet's seafloors have never been eradicated. The geology detectives can now reveal why. All around the Ring of Fire, enormous volcanoes dot a landscape warped by violent earthquakes. Offshore, the seafloor is swallowed down giant subduction trenches. But despite millions of years of subduction, the area of seafloor remains roughly the same. Geologists could only assume one thing. Somewhere far out in the ocean, volcanic activity must be creating new seafloor rocks, replacing those destroyed here during subduction. Beginning in 1977, a series of expeditions set out to investigate where this occurred. Scientists realized that if volcanic activity was constructing new seabed, the surrounding water should be warm. The Alvin submersible was equipped with high-tech sensors to discover where this warm water existed. To begin with, the crew searched the seafloor without any luck. But then they hit the jackpot. A column of rock pumping out superheated water. So there we go, the ultimate geothermal resource. You know, you, there's, you got to have heat. You got to have a fluid or be able to transfer that heat. And a lot of places, you know, you're out in the uh, resources, you can deplete the reservoirs by extracting the fluids and not replenishing those fluids. We talked about reinjecting the fluids to uh, help solve that problem. But the ultimate geothermal resource here is located at these replenishment zones in underwater. They've got all you need there. You've got the heat, got all the water you need. But there is a little problem with uh, access. This is a black smoker. Measurements of the water around these features have found temperatures in excess of 750 degrees Fahrenheit. This heat comes from magma welling up from inside the planet. It was a discovery that provided the evidence the scientists needed. These volcanic marvels mark the location of giant features called mid-ocean ridges. Mid-ocean ridges, a term you want to capitalize on there. Also, this sets up convective cycles in the oceans themselves which get into food cycles and replenishment of the freshwater ecosystem. So then, then it drives the, the, the uh, uh, thermal aspect of our atmosphere. So the convective uh, circulation patterns in our atmosphere really originate in the heating. You know, a lot of it's from the sun, but there's also a big contribution from the suboceanic, uh, mid-oceanic ridges at these ridges on the bottom of the ocean, powerful convection currents in the mantle separate Earth's... So here we go, a separating or rift opening, and uh, more than a rift, it's, you know, it's a tectonic interface. But the whole idea is that that's what we see in Iceland, this type of volcanic activity, so that uh, the volcanoes are not as tall, and there's not as violent of er eruptions occur, but they occur over a longer period of time, longer duration, less violent in nature, and uh, the lavas would be more, shall we say, fluid, more viscous. Plates, allowing lava to spill out onto the seabed. New oceanic crust is constantly being formed out in the mid-ocean ridges. That crust moves away from those ridges toward the edge of the continents where we're located now. In this way, the seafloor is constantly renewed, replacing material destroyed by subduction at the edges of the ocean. The plate tectonic cycle. Well, this is a planetary scale process. This is the, the planet itself circulating, and the rock and the magma from deep inside the Earth welling up to the surface, forming this crust. And then that crust dives back down into the Earth at the subduction zones, at the trenches. And you see that uh, we're really just 
scratch in the surface of the potential of geothermal in general. When you start to think about you know, not only the geomagnetics, uh, anti-gravity, uh, lifter, lifting devices, uh, uh, geo, shall we say, uh, magnetic repulsion or magnetically levitated bearings and uh, travel, all based in geothermal energy, uh, geothermal uh, forming the different physics, different physical pro properties you know, of particular rotation, uh, the uh, forming of the geo, uh, the magnetosphere, and then here we've got these huge sources of convection in the mantle of the Earth. So we're just scratching the surface. Geothermal energy is truly, it's huge. And it, it's mixed back into the solid Earth. So great is the power driving this system that experts see no end to the constant movement of plates around the planet. The forces involved with plate tectonics caused by the heating from the inner core of the Earth is so astronomical that there is nothing that will stop it. It seems like uh, the ring of fire will go on for some period of time. It looks as if we've been having subduction here underneath southern Alaska on the order of 200 million years. And uh, it looks like it, uh, th there's no evidence that's going to stop anytime soon. But over the coming billions of years, the ongoing movement of plates will redraw the map of the world. The Pacific plate is moving and things on it uh, ride with uh, the plates that are being subducted. So for example, the Hawaiian Islands are moving up here to Alaska. Uh, parts of California are moving up here to Alaska. Baja, California. So you see the transformal plate here as it's sliding along uh, one plate sliding north, plate sliding south, and this is where you get that extreme uh, earthquake potential closer to the surface. And uh, we're going to look at that in just a minute here as far as what's going on along the San, San Andreas Fault currently. They're having an earthquake swarm in Southern California as we speak. ...is moving north here to Alaska, so apparently Alaska is a popular place to be. It'll be the uh, resting place of all these things. So the map of the Pacific will slowly change, driven by the immense force of subduction. This is the real story of the Ring of Fire. Subduction creates the magma plumes which build the region's explosive volcanoes. Subduction powers the violent megathrust earthquakes that shake the region, leveling whole cities in seconds and causing killer tsunamis. This process of subduction just releases an enormous amount of energy through both uh, earthquakes, through building these mountains, through volcanoes. It's just uh, really inconceivably huge. This is what makes the Ring of Fire the most geologically active and most deadly place on the entire planet. You see the whole picture of creation and destruction of a plate in the Pacific Ocean. And the Ring of Fire is the boundary of that cycle and it's the place where all the destruction is happening. Geology detectives have now pieced together the evidence for what makes the Ring of Fire so dangerous and discovered what powers it. Violent eruptions of explosive blocky lava build the Ring of Fire's famous volcanoes. Mixed rocks from the seafloor found miles inland are evidence for the process of subduction that builds the volcanoes. Raised shorelines are evidence for giant megathrust earthquakes caused deep underground by subduction and GPS plots provide evidence for the immense convection currents deep in the earth which drive the entire system. These giant forces have built the ring of fire. The energy that drives this whole convective system is really without parallel on the earth. There's nothing else that we can compare to as far as the amount of energy and the force that moves the continents around. Uh, yeah, they call it geothermal, correct? So it is 
and so we say underrated in general. Compresses them against one another, drags one down beneath the other. Really just awesome forces. These forces are unstoppable. And while the shape of the Pacific will slowly change, for millions of years to come, explosive volcanoes will continue to line its shores. Dynamic proof that the Earth is never at rest. Let's take a look now at uh, the uh, San Andreas Fault, the uh, Transformal Aspect in Southern California there. Let's see what's going on in Southern California now.